Half in the bag. Come on, Barbie. Let's go party. Why, oh, it's lightning fast VCR repair shop. This is Mike. Yes, we are still in business. Oh, you're a debt collector? Sorry, wrong number. Prank call. Prank call. Well, Jay, we just got back from the Moopy Theater. Yeah, I didn't pee once. I peed two times, 22 times, actually. Well, let me, I should specify, I, I, I didn't leave the theater to go to the bathroom. I, I should make that more clear. <laughs> yeah, they got those new built-in toilets. It's just, yeah, just you don't have to get up from your seat. They bring you your pizza, and then when you're done with your pizza, to, by the end of the, halfway through this three-hour movie, you just evacuate the pizza right at your seat. No fuss, no muss. Right, right. And then the entire theater just smells like onions for the rest of the screening because you had to get a extra large pizza covered with onions for your viewing of Oppenheimer. Did you did you smell the onions from the pizza? Yes. Oh, I, did. I was I was I was thankfully out of the blast radius. Oh wow! It, it just that was. <laughs> it's called a segue. <laughs> uh... Well, you said this is the last time we're going to go to the movie theaters uh, the rest of the year, uh, but you you must have missed that Exorcist trailer. So I don't know, Jay. I wouldn't say I missed it. Are you going to go see it in the movie theater? I doubt it. Oh, dang. The Exorcist, that to me is like like for you with like Star Trek Picard, like season one, season two, you're like, oh no. Yeah, yeah. That's how I am. And it's worse with The Exorcist because there's been 5,000 Exorcist ripoffs. It's like, what can you do with a new Exorcist? Recognizable I'll give, IP. I'll give them one thing, though. It's a Blumhouse movie, which means the budget's low. It's gonna make them. It's money. gonna make money, and I'm okay with budgets being low. I'm at a serious uh, a crisis of consciousness here, Jay. Oh, Cri uh, because I've been I've been keeping an eye on this the SAG uh, after strike, uh, writer strike, etc. Mm -hmm. And I, while I don't understand everything about it, uh, I get the AI stuff. A AI and streaming residuals are the two big ones. Yes, yeah. and. Uh, from what I understand, the last strike long ago was about just plain old residuals. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think the studios gave anybody residuals. They just gave them a check to be in the movie and then said, good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, We're going to continue collecting cash for this project for the next 75 years. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so I get that. And then now they've come time to renew a contract and streaming is obviously dominating the entertainment world or it pretty much is. Mm -hmm. So you waiting to watch The Exorcist on streaming seems like you're like or me waiting to watch whatever movie on streaming uh, seems just like we're denying them of theatrical residuals, the actors and creators and writers. And yeah, stuff. it's it's a weird time. It's a weird conflict for us who have been wishing for the death of theaters for the last few years. Not really thinking about the whole streaming residual angle to it. Well, we didn't know about it. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, obviously shows you can't watch in the theater. So like if that's a Netflix show or whatever, mm -hmm. but should they be calling for boycotts of streaming services? I just got a notification the other day. Peacock was raising the rates of its streaming service. So is, uh, I think Netflix eliminated like their lowest tier service. Yeah. YouTube premium is going up. They're all, they're all in like early panic mode. Right. Uh, we Try gotta make more money real quick, right. real quick. I saw something that said studios are losing $66 million a week. Oh my Lord. Uh, what they could have paid out in residuals to people yeah. it would have ended it in a week. <laughs> I just don't understand. So I, I don't know. I, I will say though, speaking of theater, we didn't see Barbie. Everybody's doing the Barbenheimer experience. Oh God. Uh, we didn't do that, but it has been kind of neat to see everybody rallying behind both of these movies. Two big movies that could not be more different from each other come out on the same weekend. And instead of it being like pitting them against each other, everyone's just like celebrating going to the theater to see both of them. Sure. Uh, and that's kind of neat. Uh, we, we didn't see it. We, we bought our tickets for it. And we went into the theater and it was all 20 year old girls wearing pink. And they all just called the cops immediately when we walked in. 
I'm assuming they thought we were perverts. I think I saw, I saw more gay men than women. I'm assuming the movie has a very empowering message for young teenage girls that adults will latch onto and be really fucking weird about. Well, it's funny you bring up Barbie because, um, <laughs> you know, my favorite thing to do, Jay, is to read user reviews. Oh, my lord. Is this everyone saying it's feminist propaganda? This is a new game I have that will be just this one time and this one time only. Okay. And it's called, Is the Review for Barbie or Oppenheimer? <laughs> okay. Now you must look away. All right. So you don't see which column I'm reading from. Okay. Well, can you put something in front of that? That'll be easier. Put this in front of that. Is that big enough? Oh my God, that precious Betamax tape. Now destroyed forever. Shut up. Five stars. An absolute achievement. Oh, is that it? That's it. You well, gotta that guess. Be, that, that could be either. The, the, yeah, that's the fucking point of the game. I thought it would be a little more specific. They, they do get better. Okay, okay. Well, I'm an absolute achievement, I'm gonna give that to Oppenheimer. Correct. Okay. Although it could be an achievement in, in uh, uh, women empowerment, so it could be for Barbie, but yeah, you that get, was a complete you, guess. You're catching on here. Yeah. I enjoyed the movie visually, but it tries too hard to pretend it's groundbreaking. That's Barbie. Correct! Yes! I know how these simpletons think. Included many long and boring monologues that had the same message. Too many cringy, not funny moments. Oh, that's Barbie. All right. If you didn't include that last part, that could be either one, because Oppenheimer has lots of scenes of people talking. I've never fallen asleep in a theater before, but I came real close with this one. Well acted and all, but it's so long and dull. It's two hours of boring math stuff. One minute of boobs, <laughs> 10 minutes for one test explosion, then another hour for political hearings. Well, that's Barbie, of That's course. correct. Yeah. <laughs> a movie that falls short of the hype that's been building for the last four months, with the film being so generic, replicating the themes of existing movies, and not having one element of surprise. Ooh, I'm gonna say Barbie. Correct. Okay. Never have I been more disappointed in a movie. Absolute snooze fest. Oppenheimer. Correct. I don't the, know how you could fall asleep during that movie. Just constant noise. It was a three hour long panic attack. <laughs> The music, the acting, the effects, and the heaviness were all five stars. The sex, the nudity, and the runtime were so unnecessary and a big stain on the move. Just throw a bra on the floor and you're good, perverts. We'll love those parts. <laughs> uh, well, that's Oppenheimer. Correct. Bars. The movie started great, but super cringe, and the characters and the scenarios, they were involved, period. The story super forced, F-O-R-Z-E-D. Uh, well, Barbie. Correct. Five stars. Most fun I've had in ages. Smart and refreshing. Top tier cast. Acting and set design. Soundtrack is fire. <laughs> Visuals are gorgeous, touching as well as hilarious. Strikes the perfect balance. Well, that's Barbie. Nobody that's seen Oppenheimer is going to use the slang fire, even though it would be a funny pun. It, yeah. That, uh, you. I thought it was decent, but the HBO Chernobyl miniseries is what this movie was missing. Oh. Well, that's Barbie. It's of Barbie. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> you realize this. Good job. And then last Have you one, watched Chernobyl? No. I never watched it. I heard it was really good. Yeah, yeah. Barbie is literally so beautiful, colorful, and unique. The movie is hilarious, breathtaking, and heartwarming. An amazing movie that will be one of the greatest in cinematic history. Oppenheimer. Correct. You did it, Jay. I did it. I you did it. You got them all right. <laughs> We're in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. Now, a simple reductive uh, review uh, on 
uh, whatever that was, of people going, a snooze fest. Uh, you can't boil this movie down into one sentence. It's a little more no. complicated than that. Yes. But I, I will say uh, when the, the, the frat guys all get in a van to go watch this, they ain't going to have a good time. <laughs> The Inception Bros. Inception Bros. We saw some Inception Bros at the theater. They, they were like cavemen. I thought it was good, but I thought Inception was better. Yeah. More better. There is a, there is a striking caveman esque way the way he spoke. <laughs> yes. Like uh, uh, hard, hard pronunciations of words. Like, <laughs> I thought it was okay. It was movie. <laughs> But really, Inception was better. I was like, oh my God. Uh, so. I'll say it's better than Tenant because at least I finished this movie. Oh, dang. Oh, snap. Sorry, Tenant bros. That movie's boring as shit. I didn't see it. Is that that's a Christopher Nolan movie? That, that was his last movie, and that was so bogged down in because that was the gimmick. Every, the, the action is in reverse. And then there's like scene after scene. I guess similar to this, there's lots of scenes of people talking in rooms. But in that movie, it's just like scene after scene after scene of trying to justify the logistics of why the action is happening in reverse. And it's just like, I'm out. But let's talk about Oppenheimer. Uh, one, we do not see an IMAX. We're just starting off with all sorts of complaints here. Well, there's only a couple IMAX screens in the whole fucking state of Wisconsin. And we, I, I originally booked us tickets to see it on the a super screen but then I accidentally booked it at the wrong theater, and so we're standing like doofuses <laughs> outside of the movie, some Sound of Freedom or something. Oh, Sound of Freedom. That's the big movie that's just breaking box office records and selling out everywhere, but when you walk into the theater, no one's in there. Oh, it's my a, God. It's a mystery. I don't know anything I, about it. It's like a some kind of QAnon it's movie. It's like a child sex trafficking movie, well, The some, Dangers of Everyone's some, mad about it. It's, 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 it's become a political thing, I don't, of course. I, everything is. Yeah. I hate everything. And so... It, uh, my, my ticket stubs said go just go to this theater and it's in there. I'm like that's not Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. And then so we bought tickets for Oppenheimer on and it was on a regular screen. Yes. And once again, we talked about this with Guardians of the Galaxy. The aspect ratio was uh, uh, window boxed, pillar boxed. It was whatever. letter boxed inside of a pillar box. Yes. So uh, it did not fill up the entire screen which is a bigger deal for a movie like this than 80 for Brady or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, once it's so dark, it's like, okay, well, what if the screen happened to be that much smaller? Like, I would be okay. But the screen is literally there. Mm -hmm. Can you fill the fucking screen up? Yes. I don't know. Is that crazy to ask? Well, I think this is especially, like, if you want people to keep going to the theater, like, these are yeah. the things that you need to, there needs to be some quality control. You once told me a tale of when uh, you bought uh, tickets to see like an old movie. Uh, the Times. Oriental Theater, The Times. It was at yes. The Times, it was uh, Psycho. Yes. And it was just like a projected DVD. Yes. You could see like the DVD menu. Right, and you're like, oh my God, I, why did I leave my house? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Christopher Nolan shot this on IMAX film and then I'm getting a, a digital projection of it that's smaller than the theater screen. I feel like I'm like, Back in film school, when they would play a DVD on the screen, you know, yeah. and we'd have a, sometimes we'd play film prints, we'd get actual prints of stuff, but mm -hmm. they'd play a DVD and it would be like letterboxed and pillar boxed on the left and right. And it, I'm like, why are we living through this? Mm -hmm. Jack, go tell Chris the theater keeps fucking his films up. Christopher, Christopher Nolan. You yes, yeah. he turned on her top hat monkey goes West script, script, but. I just wanted to interject something we didn't bring up in our discussion, but before the movie, there was a trailer for Alexander Payne's new film, which was shot in 185 to one, a more open aspect ratio than the digital version of Oppenheimer we saw, which is 239 to one. And that trailer, did take up the entire screen, at least height-wise. Which means that the theater must have calibrated the framing of their projector for whatever was the most open aspect ratio on the digital file that they're given. I don't know about you, but I would rather have the wrong framing for a three-minute trailer than for the beautifully shot two-hour and 47-minute movie that follows. F*** you, Alexander Payne! This is all your fault! Although, can I say, I don't know if this is a, a controversial opinion or something that other people might agree with. 
I didn't see the necessity for IMAX because uh, the whole movie is looking at old white guys' wrinkles. <laughs> Close-ups of people in tiny rooms, yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's the contrast of the movie, that it's so intimate, but it's about something so massive. I mean, anything um, projected on IMAX shot on that caliber of film would be great. And I'm sure I would love to watch this movie on IMAX, but I think, like... A, a big swath of the population watch that trailer and, and a whole bunch of it's like them assembling the bomb and like, tick, 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 you know, it's yeah. like, it was a great trailer. And it, it, obviously I enjoyed the movie for many other reasons, but mm -hmm. the, the, you've got to see this fucking thing in IMAX. It'll blow you away. Oppenheimer. Yeah. IMAX. And then it's like, it doesn't have, Black and, and obviously, it's, hearings. yeah, it's obviously a very different type of movie. But I did see the Dark Knight in IMAX, yeah, and the big like chase scene in the middle of the movie through downtown yeah, Chicago, so you, like I mean, that was pretty pretty epic. I don't want to be um, a, sound like a dummy, but that's kind of like what I when I think of IMAX, I think of like big action kind of movies, and yeah. this is not that. I, I think Christopher Nolan is just one of those people who is really just la like Tarantino is just like latched onto film and wants that right. that experience, like regardless of really what the movie subject matter is. People um, just want to see Transformers Rise of the Beasts. <laughs> Look, uh, even if it's a movie like Transformers Rise of the Beasts, is just make it take up the full theater screen. Yeah, that's, that's all, all I, I ask. That's all I want. That's all we ask for. Um, but Oppenheimer, fantastic. Obviously carried by all the the really great performances. Well, I, more than anything, I would say it's carried by the score. That music is nonstop. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if you want to go right there, we can go right there first. Well, it was the first thing that stuck out. To, I mean, I like the movie a lot too, but early on I was a little iffy because it was just like constant score. And it's like those early scenes, like they're kind of small and intimate. It's him getting to know these other characters and getting to know like Florence Pugh. And it's just like nonstop yeah, yes, overbearing yes, yes. music. I was like, oh no. As the movie goes along and it gets more intense, it feels more appropriate. Yes, yeah. The mu music is is the big, the big uh, black eye on the movie for me. Mm. I would, I would Zimmer? say only during the first like no, act or so for well, me. Well, what, like you said, when it gets, the ending is great. See, I, I had this um, kind of like idea in my head of what the movie was going to be. Mm. I didn't read reviews for it other than uh, user reviews where they just say, it was long and dull and boring and I shit my pants. <laughs> like, those are like one star ratings or five stars. It was great. <laughs> and I shit my pants. <laughs> and I shit my pants. <laughs> um, so I didn't really read like actual reviews of yeah. people breaking. So I didn't know what I was, what I was getting into. I, I know who Robert Oppenheimer is. I know... They made the atomic bomb in Los Alamos, and they tested it, and then dropped it on Japan. I didn't know like anything about him, and so I was excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I was also very much looking forward to a little more uh, meat about how the bomb was created in more detail, mm. and less like kind of interpersonal, like with the scientists and this and that. And so they kind of glossed over that and they really got into his 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 character um, less less so about there was personal stuff, but um, really about the you know his loyalties and his is he was a complicated man, but he wasn't like um, he wasn't savvy with like the politics of everything. Yeah, um, and he was fairly open minded. Mm -hmm. um, both like politically and ideologically and all that. And that, that, that that's kind of where it goes in the third act too, yeah. about how, how you're perceived or how people can manipulate how you're perceived, that yes, stuff. Yes, but the politics. Um, and, and that's where it was like, yeah, is he a hero? Is he not a hero? Like he can be pre presented in any different way. Mm -hmm. And then what is internal conflict about creating the bomb and all that stuff. Um, but I think my favorite scene in the entire movie was when they were in like, they're in the war room or a small room and they're discussing like where to drop the bomb mm -hmm. because there was no music. Yeah. And I was just so engrossed in that. And, and I kept like, when you said the early scenes with Florence Pugh and the, the style of the editing is very like, um, jumping around. It's, yeah, it's non-linear, which yes. uh, Nolan likes to do. Very non-linear, uh, switching between black and white here and there 
Um, you, you catch a little glimpse of something that um, the biggest one is his interaction with Einstein that happens at the beginning that sort of like bookends the whole movie. That's the, uh, the Inception top. Remember that? So the yeah. movie ever, the movie uh, Inception leads up to that top. Is it going to fall over? Is it not? Is it a dream or is it not? Right. The whole movie keeps coming back to what did he talk to Einstein yeah. about? Yeah. But there, there's like little cutaways like the foot stomping in the uh, auditorium, which is what happens at the end. It's going to flash back and forth. So the editing is nonlinear and you kind of have to keep up paying attention. Um, but it's really hard when they're hitting you with that score all the time. And it kind of feels like you're watching a really long movie trailer. I, I was thinking, yeah, for the jump. first half hour or so, it's yeah. like this just feels like an endless montage. Yeah. Like something that would be in the middle of a movie somewhere. Uh, and I was picturing a lot, and all those scenes, like the actual, like, I mean, the acting, of course, is great, and they're shot well, of course. They're good scenes, but they are, I think, tampered a bit by that endless score, which kind of ruins the flow of the scene. Right. Cause like you mentioned, the yeah, the scene where they're in talking about where to drop the bomb and yeah it's like oh now i'm invested in what yeah. the dialogue is i can stop and i can listen mm -hmm. and i'm i'm picturing all those scenes where they're sitting around that big table robert Downey jr's there and they're talking and oh the round table with the yeah big, yes big plants in the middle yeah um robert Downey jr plays like the uh, uh i guess you'd call him the villain of the movie he's he was the head of the um, atomic AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, and then he wants to become a cabinet uh, level mm -hmm. position, so he has to go through a, a confirmation hearing. Um, but he uh, he wants to sabotage Oppenheimer because he's mad at him, and that becomes like that's the thing, thread of the movie, the big like. Um, so it's, it becomes less about him, like the process of him building the the bomb or why, and it kind of becomes engaged in this like political stuff. And I'm just watching those scenes and I'm just loving the dialogue and I'm loving the acting. And I'm just like, I can't hear them. I can't hear what they're saying. I can't let, let what they're saying resonate. Yeah. Through like, and, and really absorb it and kind of listen. And I'm imagining those scenes with the music plucked out and the 95% of the audience that will get up and leave because it's <laughs> too boring. And in a, in a weird way, I thought this can't, this can't have been the thought process of such a auteur like Christopher Nolan. I, Did he go like- That's just his style. That's just what he likes. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, he's always, his movies always have that kind of bombastic, you know, feel to him. That's, and I, I, like I said, I was fine with it through most of the movie. It was just the early scenes. It felt like it should have ramped up to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the parts where it really works is like the lead up to the dropping the test bomb. Yeah. Like that whole sequence. And then following that, when he gives his like speech in front of the crowd of people and he's imagining them all just being like. Oh, nudes. yeah. All that like, stuff's great. All, all the, the sound and the music and the editing and all that is like perfect. Yeah. That whole, I don't know, 15, 20 minute stretch of the movie is, is by far the best part. Yeah. I, and see, like, yeah, that whole sequence when there's like. You're building to something, and they're 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 building the town, and I just loved all that stuff, and I, I was really interested in in the I loved that the way they presented the closed door uh, inquiry or hearing of um, Oppenheimer, where it's in that just a tiny little office. Yeah, it's not some kind of big grand set. And when the movie starts, you don't really understand what's going on, why right. they're in that tiny room, and then it kind of, yeah. And I just I just want to sit there and listen and absorb all this great dialogue and character stuff, and it's it's played too dramatically. And then so, towards the end, like when Emily Blunt gives her testimony, that part's really good. Um, yeah. And it, 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 her kitty, her character, has her moment. Mm -hmm. um, and... That's deserving of music, but I guess if that's his style, I'm picturing like a scene from like the original Twelve Angry Men. Right, just in that room, and I'm just picturing like Hans Zimmer music just smeared all over yeah. the top of it. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps if the uh, gentleman down there was disagreeing with us, uh, perhaps you can tell us why. You know, there was no what you're thinking, and uh, we might be able to show you where you're mixed up. Hi, I'm Robert Downey Jr. And I'm Christopher Nolan, and this is the Wired Autocomplete interview. I didn't even know Robert Downey Jr. was in it. I didn't know half the people that are in this movie. Every actor you've ever seen is in this movie. The trailer primarily focuses on the Los Alamos town. Yeah. The, the assembling of the bomb. They show Einstein. They show, like, all the, all the stuff. 
And I'm like, okay, it's going to be a movie about that. And um, him and his wife, they bring up argue a little bit. Mm -hmm. She throws a bottle at him, tells him to get out. Go make your bomb. You're too invested in your work. My baby's crying. I'm drunk. Go make your bomb. <laughs> I thought there was going to be a little drama there, but it was really re a really complex character study of, of Oppenheimer and big, big themes of yeah. uh, like what, you know, unleashing the, he's the Prometheus, gave fire to man. Mm -hmm. Well, and being so caught up in figuring out like how to actually do it that you're not really thinking about the end goal and what kind of uh, uh, effect it'll have, right. like all that stuff is great. It's like, it's not that black and white. It's not that clear cut because there's all these people yelling in his ear, you know, the, the Russians are going to develop it. Uh, should we share, we're allied with the Russians at the time because Hitler attacked them. So it's like, should we tell the Russians about it? No, they're going to be our next enemy. Uh, should we, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, evidence that the Nazis are building a bomb. Oh wait, we just defeated them. Oh, but there's still Japan. Uh, well, you know, and then all the young people who are working on the project are all kind of, uh, their morality is uh, coming into play and they're wondering if this is the right thing to do. And he's just like, well, we got to do this. Or he really wants to because he's a scientist and so super complicated. And the fact that we never see any footage of war at all right. in the whole film. Exactly. Just people in rooms talking. <laughs> yeah, we never see, the, uh, yeah, never see the, the, we don't have a, and I think that, that was an interesting choice that will disappoint many a frat guy is we didn't see the bomb getting dropped on Nagasaki in IMAX. Yeah, that's true. We just see the test footage. Yeah. You just see the, the test bomb go off and you don't, he, he's waiting around, like waiting to hear back. Like, did we drop it? Like, yeah. And they're just like, yeah, we'll keep you. We've gotten what we want from you. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. I was told that there would be full frontal nudity. Oh yeah. We got to see Florence's pubes. There was not, <laughs> there was not full frontal nudity. No. Where did that come from? It, but that's, that's some of those reviews I was reading. Yeah, but that was like, the thing I saw online where people were like, "Just so you know, if you're going to see this movie, it's pretty racy." And I was like, "This is what we can like." When did we turn into such prudes? These Gen Zers, they're all they all got their panties in a bunch. When when there's no movies to release next summer, they're going to be re-releasing stuff like Basic Instinct, and all these kids are going to have a heart attack. <laughs> Bring back nudity in movies, damn it. <laughs> we can handle it. We're adults. <gasps> They're like, there's a 15 minute full frontal. Like, what? There's nothing. What are you talking about? Killian Murphy's sitting in a chair with his legs crossed. So that's, yeah. that's it. <laughs> if you can't handle Killian Murphy nipples, then don't go see this film, I guess. Yeah, you don't even see his plutonium rod. <laughs> It wasn't like sex, sex nudity. It wasn't like gratuitous or or uh, uh, nudity that was meant to be arousing. I think it was like it was metaphorical almost. Is like these two they they, they were, were comfortable around each other. They were comfortable and they were exposing themselves yeah. of, uh, internally. Mm -hmm. it, it was almost metaphorical because he was cheating on his wife and she was nuts. Yeah. And they, they, they had a bond and it was more than just like nudity. Like yeah. let's have some boobs in this movie. It wasn't that stupid. It was, it was, and it was smart or tastefully done. Like it's a fucking problem, but you know, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't even, I can't if, even it, if there isn't a subject. controversy, you gotta create one. Well, I think we would both recommend Oppenheimer. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're dubbing it the last movie. Y yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. It's not a sequel. It's not a part of a franchise yet. <laughs> Who knows what they have planned? They got Iron Man in the film, so you never know. But uh, yeah, I, there was a trailer before this for Scorsese's new movie. Yeah, that looks good. And it was produced by Apple. And so I assumed it was, oh, they're having a trailer for an Apple TV movie, but no, it's a theatrical film. Yeah. Um, but I know he has trouble getting movies made now. 
Like he had to uh, make, he had to settle for Netflix to make his Irishman movie. Um, so like Tarantino, who's only making one more movie apparently, Christopher Nolan, or dying breed of filmmakers that can make movies at this scale and get them released in theaters. So I think it's definitely worth seeing just to support that. Like yeah. Indiana Jones, I, I guess this isn't completely related to the, the strike stuff, but just thinking about all the movies that are flopping, Indiana Jones, giant flop. You said the new Mission Impossible movie is a huge flop. I, I don't know if it's a huge flop, but it's underperforming. It's not doing what they expected it to, and I don't even know if it's going to make its budget back. And then you have The Flash, which I guess is the biggest flop in the history of Warner Brothers until Aquaman 2 comes out, but that's been delayed again. Like, all these movies, like, just stop spending... I don't know what the budget for Oppenheimer is. It's probably up there, just based on the cast. And Christopher Nolan's one of the people who can still, like, get a budget like that for a movie like this. Um, but I think I think we're on the verge of, kind of like in the 60s, when they were doing all the big uh, disaster movies and, you know, Earthquake and Airport and all those type of movies. And then and that Cleopatra crashed. starring uh, oh, yeah, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, now they have a new Cleopatra coming out with Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot! Like, that's perfect timing. Those are the movies that killed the studio because they all cost too much. And then in the 70s, you got, like, the best movies ever made. All these small, uh, tour-driven things. They took chances. You get your... Taxi Drivers and Exorcist and Easy all these Rider. Easy Rider, all these original movies. So maybe this, the combination of these big movies flopping and the strike, where they're not studios aren't making any money. I'm wondering if that'll be the dawn of a new era of <laughs> modestly budgeted films that are unique and interesting. Some, so it's a sea change here. Something, something will change, and I don't know what. Because uh, have we all been getting away with murder, basically, with the streaming services? Because all that content, and you're paying what is a reasonable amount of money. People complain about the streaming costs, right? But what Netflix is $15 a month or something? Yeah. I don't know. I don't even know. I subscribed to the I don't care. Peacock was $5.99, now it's $6.99. Right. And there's just like endless content. It's so much different than like going well, going to the theater and paying uh, what it costs a month to get a streaming service to watch one movie, to see one film, and yeah. just have it in your memory. Animated movies are flopping because I think because like a uh, family, like husband, wife, three children, like that's expensive as fuck to go to the theater. So they say, eh, we'll wait three months. And we'll watch it on Disney Plus. So it's changed the entire industry, and there's no going back. No. Um, in the same way that, like, music in the early 2000s. Yeah, yes, like, the, the MP3s and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no returning from that. But you have to navigate that and make sure everybody is... I think the, stu uh, the studios, Netflix, and all the streamers have been kind of thinking they can get away with hoarding all yeah. the, the money they make from streaming. Well, that's what I meant by getting away with murder, because... Uh, as a consumer, we're not paying all that much for all that work and content, and the, the, they're not paying, I think, the people that make it yeah. a, a adequate or reasonable amount. Um, they're paying their stars that show up on shows, you know, Harrison Ford is on a sh shrinking on Apple Plus. I'm sure he got a giant paycheck for being that. I don't even know what that is. But that's the thing. There's so much shit. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't I, even know that was a show. Um, I, I just thought of that as an example. There's hundreds and hundreds, thousands of shows. Yeah. And um, if they eventually negotiate some kind of agreement, I think that the, the, the end of everything is always the consumer pays more. Mm -hmm. No matter what. The, 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 the big studio people aren't going to go, okay, we'll make 90% less profits. <laughs> Bob Iger will only make ten thousand dollars a minute instead of a hundred thousand dollars a minute. Um, we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. We'll keep our prices on the streaming platforms the same, and we'll pay every actor and every you know writer much more, and give them tons of royalty money from the streaming service. But you, the consumer, won't pay. No, every price is going to quadruple or tenfold. Uh, go, go up in price hmm. if they resolve this. And you know what? Like, 
I, I would be okay with paying some more. A lot of people won't, and then they'll drop off, and then the numbers will go like this, and then everything will blow up. Well, eventually it'll turn into, streaming will turn into cable. Where cable, you pay one flat fee a month and you get all these channels. Now you're paying individual streaming services and you're paying for, you know, five, six, seven, eight services a month. It ends up costing more than cable. So eventually they're going to have to work out some sort of deal where you can get packages of different streaming services. I think that's the only way that they can justify charging how much they're going to have to charge people. Yeah, well, they're going to either have to cut expenses but it's just like they, there's such a desire for more content. So it's like a supply and demand thing. So the more something's in demand, the more supply you need. Um, but it can't be it can't be costly because then it'll become too expensive. Well, that's what happened with Netflix. They were just just tossing money everywhere to just see what sticks, and they reached a point where they're like, we can't do this anymore. So I think now the only thing they dump money into is Stranger Things, because that's their big show. But there was a period, like, they financed The Irishman, which I know is relatively well, they had expensive. They uh, Adam Sandler deal. They had an Adam Sandler deal. They were just giving money to everyone to try and keep people coming to their service. And then they don't have to release the numbers of how anything does. So all the, the people that made these projects have no idea what's going on. Right. It's just a giant mess. And the studios were uh, hoping that they could just keep getting away with it for, <laughs> for as long as possible. And they did, and now they're at the end of that. It's a really, really weird threesome. It's the studios, actors, writers, creators, you know, et cetera, crew members, blah, blah, blah. We'll just call them the creatives, mm -hmm. the studios, and the consumers. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the consumer and the studios, studios are charging lot, consumers are paying relatively little. This this part of the threesome got fucked over. Yeah. Uh, now they want their share. And then it's just going to come down on the consumer, go back this way. It'll all even out eventually. They'll figure some way to work around it. Whether it's less content, um, uh, more quality content, but less of it, mm -hmm. or more shit content, it's like uh, too much of a, too, you can't have too much of a good thing. Mm hmm is it'll just, uh, it's, a, it's a fantasy. It all has to balance out. There has to be a balance in the force, Jay. I understand, I um, understand. But well, that's I, why they were hoping to cut out the, the creative aspect of it and just have AI write their scripts and shit. That's another thing is... Uh, and that's gonna come back on the consumers because they're gonna say, this feels weird. And all those, <laughs> uh, those extras, dirty, dirty extras that they have to have in scenes, they just have digital people in the background and blah, 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 blah digital sets, yeah, digital, yeah. digital, digital, but all digital needs a person at a computer creating that digital until the AI can do it. Yep. It'll all be over soon. <laughs> Where's Oppenheimer? I mean, he's probably dead, but can Dro you- Drop that bomb. Can you figure out to make that bomb you talked about that ignites the atmosphere? Yeah. Can yeah. you just tweak the bomb a little to do that? <laughs> just, just do that? <laughs> just drop it on Bob Iger's nutsack? <laughs> And, uh, and but wait until after the final season of Stranger Things, please. Oh my God. I gotta see how that ends. I can't wait for more bloated, <laughs> self-indulgent, self-important content to come out. You didn't love the end of that last season where there's like 15 minutes of every character looking off at the distance and it just went on and on and on? I'm done, I'm done, <laughs> I'm done. Now that Okay, I won't watch Strange New Worlds. I just can't stand it. I'm so sorry, everybody. I just can't stand it. You've tried um, it, though. I've people, tried it. People are always like, you got to give it a shot. And, and I, people have said that about Andor. I, I might watch that because that seems like it could be good. I'll just, like, ignore that it's Star Wars. I just, like, just maybe it's a good show. Maybe it's sure. well written. I don't know. But um, yeah, I've been watching Lower Decks um, starring our friend Jack Quaid, who's in this film. He plays the bongos. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, I enjoy Lower Decks. It's it's a comedy. I think it's aimed at adults, but it's not super like raunchy. It is kind of. I don't know. I I, I, I like. Get the, I get the vibe of like a Futurama. Futurama, type. Rick and Morty kind of thing, but um, maybe not as offensive, or vulgar, or, or weird. But um, it's cute. It's fun. The Star Trek storylines are very Star Trekky. Uh, I would I would. I think that show creator Mike McMahon should make real Star Trek live oh. action people. I think he would be good at it. 
Um, so I thought, hey, maybe I'll watch that other show and see what that's like, even though it's for kids and I probably won't like it. Um, but then I saw it got pulled and then I typed it. I went to Paramount Plus, I logged in, I looked for it, it wasn't there. Yeah. And I saw they were selling Blu-rays. I'm like, you know what, God damn it, I'm just gonna bug, buy the Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do my part for, for th this, for this little show. <laughs> that you don't, probably aren't even gonna like. That I'm probably not even gonna <laughs> like because that really upset me. Yeah. I, 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 I like streaming, it's very convenient, but I don't like that dark side of it, that, um, that gross corporate side where they could just delete things yeah. and just where you have people like David Zasloff in charge who have yeah. absolutely no interest in anything but the bottom line. Yeah. So I think if people bought physical media, it might move the needle a little. Yeah. I don't know. I, I have always been a proponent of physical media. I love streaming. I am subscribed to streaming services, but you got to keep, if there's something you want, I, I think buying it physically is still the only safe bet and it not just vanishing. Well, that's the downside. The convenience, there, the, there, there's a yin and yang to everything. The convenience of streaming, the downside of it is things can magically appear on it, but they can magically disappear too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, the, it's the big buffet uh, metaphor. It's just like, the, oh, we don't have that item on the buffet today. <laughs> well, why not? We just don't, okay. We could say we saved 75 cents in our business today by not having that item. We looked at our numbers for the week. General Sow's chicken wasn't, wasn't moving as quickly as the others. Uh, so we took it off the buffet line. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I paid to get that. Sorry. There's nothing you could literally nothing you could do about it yeah. unless you go home and make it yourself. And that's what the physical media is. Yeah. You got a uh, whole rack of General Sow's chicken. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's all interesting. It's, it's, all, it's a tumultuous, uh, interesting time. I hope all, all the actors and, and writers get paid their, their fair due, their fair amounts. They all get their good streaming residuals. But I asked, like I asked you at the start of this program or story or whatever this is, uh, telethon, what are we on? I asked you, should we all boycott streaming services? That's the question. Does that help or does that hurt? Because then they don't have any money to pay their actors and writers. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, us as a consumers are, shouldn't be required to think so much That's about, true. About, about this stuff. It's, a, it's an industry uh, problem internally. We are just the, the sheeple that consume. Oppenheimer's good though. I'm, I'm glad that a movie like this is still getting made, so. I learn a little something. I learned a little something. I went deaf because the movie was so goddamn loud. I learned that- I had several panic attacks. It's everything you want in a film. Yeah. <laughs> I learned they don't trust the audience to, to have the, the mental capacity to sit through a, a boring talking scene <laughs> without thunderous score playing in your, the background and cutting everything completely out of order. I would have liked to see this linearly. I think I would have enjoyed it more. At I least think. an alternate cut. It's just the- No music and a linear edit. You can do that in DaVinci Resolve. It has a magic button that you can hit that just eliminates anything that isn't dialogue. It like detects it. Mm. So when this comes out on physical media, we'll buy it and we'll make the, the boring cut. Rearrange all the scenes in yes. the proper order. I was thinking about, this kind of reminded me a bit of Citizen Kane, and there's that famous part in Citizen Kane with the bird squawk. Like the time his wife left him. <laughs> to wake up the audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I don't know how true that is, but that's the, true. that's the legend, is that halfway through the movie, they had a bird squawk as a transition just to make sure people were still paying attention. And there's a lot of that in this movie when it just cuts to like close-ups of dust and particles and... Yeah, he starts this. having like internal conflict yeah. and it's represented by like shaking and yeah. It, it makes sense in the story, but I was I was thinking about that too, in addition to the music. It's like, is that just a thing to kind of jolt people? Someone, you get people to look up from their nachos. <laughs> is it, are they gonna light another bomb off? Their onion pizzas. Are they gonna light another bomb off? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't they show all the bombs? When is he going to punch Hitler? And we had a couple halfway markers. Yeah. Well, yeah it was more like third those. markers in this, third way markers, but yeah, I'm going to stumble in. 
Can you build the bomb yet? <laughs> <laughs> grandma comes in. Not yet, Grandma. Plenty of open seats. <laughs> Can you build the bomb yet? Not yet, Grandpa. Oh, good. We'll have to buy every movie just in time. <laughs> Did he build the bomb yet? No, Grandma. He didn't build the bomb yet. Okay. They sit down. Should we leave after he builds the bomb? <laughs> we'll beat the rush to the parking lot if we believe after he builds the bomb. There's a lot of more movie after he builds the bomb. What happens after he builds the bomb? Oh, there's a whole bunch of scenes of people talking in a tiny room, Grandpa. There's a lot oh. of Senate hearings, Grandpa. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll I don't leave. need to see that. I lived through it. We'll leave after he builds the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> 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 hey, so is everyone here? Yes, we talk. If you don't have a motive, where's your case, right? The boy knew the knife could be identified as the one you just brought. Here's what I think, and I have no personal feelings about this. I just want to talk about facts. The kid you just decided isn't guilty was seen ramming this into his father. I don't know about the rest of them, but I'm getting a little tired of this yakety yakking back and forth. It's getting us nowhere. You can't prove he didn't get to the door. Sure, you can take all the time, hobble around the room, but you can't prove it. You lousy bunch of bleeding. You're not going to intimidate me. I'm entitled to my opinion. Wherever you run into it, prejudice always obscures the truth. I don't really know what the truth is. I don't suppose anybody will ever really know. Nine of us now seem to feel that the defendant is innocent. But we're just gambling on probabilities. We may be wrong. Maybe trying to let a guilty man go free, I don't know. Nobody really can. But we have a reasonable doubt. And that's something that's very valuable in our system. No jury can declare a man guilty unless it's sure. <laughs>